Good morning everyone. Hope I'm not running too late. Um, it was a bit of a last minute uh, flight up here, uh, down here this morning. And uh, I uh, just met Cameron for the first time and I think he's done the hard bit. He's given you the, the uh, talk about how to do this surgery uh, with uh, uh, fluoro guided uh, II. And Cameron, that's, that's um, it's quite challenging. Um, this, I think this will, if, if you can transition over to stealth guided navigation for this operation, it'll uh, reduce the, uh, the stress factors by uh, exponentially. Um, and Sylvia, thanks for asking me to come back again this year to do this talk. I know that uh, after last year, quite a few people took up this surgery in, in Brisbane. And uh, I, I would hazard a guess that uh, I'm probably not the, the most common provider of this surgery in town now. So it's been, it's been quite a popular procedure since it came out. Before we start uh, talking about the actual procedure, I just wanted to make sure that, that you were cognizant of the fact that this is back pain surgery. And um, uh, back pain surgery versus surgery to decompress neural structures uh, is controversial and conjectural. Uh, this is in the eyes of uh, other surgeons, our colleagues, um, many non-surgeons who work in the back pain and pain therapeutic industry, and pretty much all insurers always raise a bit of an eyebrow when we start talking about back pain surgery, lumbar fusion, uh, and uh, implantation of prosthetics. And um, I don't know how familiar you follow it. I, I certainly do follow it because I run a practice um, that integrates rehabilitation very strongly into my surgery. Um, I, don't, I don't outsource any of my post-operative rehabilitation. And, um, and so I'm very aware of this undercurrent of anti-spinal fusion uh, campaign. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an influential sector because there's certain people within the, within the hierarchy that are influencing Medicare, influencing policy, policy makers. So just be, be cognizant of that when, when we're, we're doing um, uh, back pain surgery, of course, which, which SIJ will fall under. And, and I don't know as spinal surgeons that we are collaborating very well at the moment, um, but I've certainly raised this with the Spine Society of Australia, and we're in the process of um, creating a, a, a subcommittee to address these issues. Because um, uh, there's, there's uh, I don't, has anyone come across this social media post? It's, it's, um, it's quite concerning that, that, a, that an agency like Choosing Wisely Australia, which is supposed to be an objective um, source of information for the public, for GPs, for patients, um, are really putting this type of message out there that uh, if you have back pain, just leave the surgeon out of the discussions, okay? And that's a very, very dangerous message. And there are many very influential people. Here's just one of them that I, I, I sort of pay close attention to because he's one of the most prolific publishers uh, in the back pain um, uh, research uh, papers. And, uh, you know, they are talking to the, med um, the Department of Health and Aging. They're uh, coming out with this sort of stuff that really is undermining our, our, our craft. And we're really not doing too much about it. They're talking to uh, private health insurers, okay? And, um, you know, the Minister for, for Health. This, this type of message, although you might think it's just a, a bit of a social media Twitter post, they have a lot of influence and they have a lot of people that follow them. And you never know, it's the next person that follows them may be the director of a hospital or, the, or someone who can, can make significant changes to our practice. And when you actually understand back pain, uh, you can see where the huge um, failings are uh, in this message. There's a, a massive amount of misinformation, misguided information that is being conveyed to the public and, and undermining us as spinal surgeons. Look at, I mean, you know, what does that say to someone uh, about our job as, as spinal surgeons, that surgery is the ultimate placebo? And it's, it's, it's highly dangerous and, and we really need to do something about it. Um, and I put this article in the, the surgical uh, journal not too long ago talking about back pain surgery. 
And we need to understand that back pain surgery is absolutely essential, or spine surgery for back pain is highly, highly necessary, but the spine surgery that we do doesn't actually address a condition that is primarily functional, because surgery is a structural repair, and the root cause of back pain symptoms is a functional disease. So if we, if we do something structural to the sacroiliac joint or lumbar spine, we must not ignore the fact that the primary cause of that person's condition was a functional one. And when I refer to the term functional, I, ref I refer to the biomechanical function of the spine. The biomechanics of how we move our spine is what, is, is what the re initial trigger is that then creates the back pain symptoms. And when you ignore that year after year, you then get the activation of pain generators, nociception, inflammation, um, and structural changes that then cause, that then lead to the disability. Okay, that's my little, I can't sort of do a talk without a little bit of a, a rant about that. This is our industry standard. Uh, and this is m my practice, and this, this is my, my consulting room, pretty much. My consulting room is just down that corridor, and this is my rehabilitation centre. And it's vastly different from standard rehabilitation, okay? This, this type of therapy does not do anything to reverse functional deficits, whereas what we really need to be focusing on after our SIJ surgery or after our ALIF or PLIF is restoring movement proficiency and biomechanics. This does not restore movement proficiency or biomechanics for activities of daily living. But we can, I'm happy to talk a bit more about that later. Um, so, talking about sacroiliac joint dysfunction, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to double up a little bit of the stuff that Cameron's uh, already talked about. Uh, I think we've certainly underestimated the prevalence, and, and that's because of a couple of reasons. Number one, in the past, and I certainly know that um, you know, five years ago, I, I wasn't really thinking about SIJ as a diagnosis, and so it wasn't at the forefront of my mind, and I was also very disconnected from the treatment for it because I didn't feel like I had very um, usable, user-friendly uh, tools to, to address it, even if it was. So um, I, if it was SIJ, I was sort of relying on someone else to sort out the problem or sort of shrugging my shoulders and saying, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, when I started doing a bit more SIJ uh, surgery uh, because of our, our focus on back pain, um, uh, we, we had a few different uh, implants that we, we used and um, the, the, the triangular side bone, um, some of the zygo lock type of um, uh, implants was pretty unrewarding. And then um, Rialto has really transformed that, that practice uh, for um, the better. So I won't bore you too much on the anatomy, I'm sure you're fully aware. Just be, remember that the, the joint has uh, a, a fibr fibrotic component and a articular component. I'll show you a few more slides about that. It's a pretty safe procedure because um, all of our work's being done out here and there's not, there's not too much that can go wrong out here between the skin and our um, surgical corridor uh, as compared to the side bone technique where you know, there's a, we've had one case at our hospital where the patient had massive gluteal, gluteal artery bleeding and uh, had to go back to surgery. Uh, and not one of my patients, but had to go back to surgery you know, the next morning to evacuate this massive hematoma in his, in his gluteal um, musculature. Um, you're going to be pretty unlucky to hit these, you know, uh, these great vessels as, as compared to uh, ALIF uh, surgery, um, where you're sort of, you know, not really looking forward to this operation um, from the, purely from the front, and you're going to be pretty unlucky to um, damage the uh, neural structures um, that may come into play with this surgery uh, through the neural foramina or anteriorly. Um, the joint is a, uh, 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 the range of motion of the joint is very small, but just remember that it, it is inherently an unstable joint because it has um, translation and nutation. Um, and so it's, it's moving through multiple axes of, oops, it's moving through multiple axes of, um, of rotation. So inherently it's, uh, it's an unstable joint. 
Um, so it's actually not surprising that um, sacroiliac joint dysfunction develops at a more prevalent um, rate than we may have uh, initially thought. Um, there's, it's, it's highly innovated, uh, so there's, there's a lot of ways that inflammation and nociception can become uh, activated in the sacroiliac joint. So there's multiple nociceptive, nociceptive uh, receptors um, and the development of inflammation through the synovial uh, component um, is uh, prominent. And remember that when we're doing radiofrequency neurotomy as well, that the proceduralist can only have access to the, an the, the dorsal rami and it, ha it does have innovation in the anterior part of the joint which is not going to respond at all to radiofrequency uh, ablation. Um, the mechanism for the development of the condition, uh, as I said, my, my philosophy is that it's a primary movement dysfunction, a biomechanical dysfunction uh, that leads to the instability, the activation of nociception and inflammation, acquiring the secondary structural changes, and if nothing is addressed in a timely manner, the development of tertiary centralised pain. If, if you've got your, your head around central pain, um, and you did the best operation uh, known to man to stabilize a joint, the patient is not going to feel any better. Okay, so you really need to think, does this patient have a high level of central pain or is their pain predominantly being driven by nociception and inflammation? We don't really need to worry about neuropathic pain entering into, the, into this discussion as compared to the lumbar spine and the nerve roots and the quarter equina. But if, if the patient has a lot of nociceptive activation and inflammation and very little central pain mechanisms active, then the moment you put your, your Rialto screws in, they, they feel cured the next morning. If the patient has a combination of nociception, inflammation and, and centralization, they're still going to feel their pain the next, the next day. And it's not until we start to break down the central pain mechanisms that they'll say, oh, thanks, the surgery's been successful. And that can be as long as six months later. Um, and that comes down to your, your decision about, that, that really should influence your decision about proceeding, proceeding to surgery is whether you feel comfortable tackling this component of that patient's um, back pain um, syndrome. I think you're, you'd be well aware of the, um, uh, the uh, structural changes that can happen and, and drive all this process. Um, adjacent segment disease seems to be a, 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 a significant precipitator of the instability. So I just explain it to my patients if they've had a lumbar fusion. It's essentially like there's a crowbar that's uh, increasing the mechanical leverage on the sacroiliac joint to create uh, and activate those uh, pain mechanisms because they've got this you know, one or two segment or even more um, uh, titanium uh, rod that's levering on that sacroiliac joint uh, juncture. Um, some quoted prevalences. Um, that the sacroiliac joint pain may be uh, as high as uh, 15 to 40 odd percent in um, uh, our back pain patients. The other uh, challenging thing with uh, working up our patients is that there's a lot of overlap between the way someone presents, uh, be, having a discopathy, having a facet, ar facet arthropathy or arthritis um, and the, the pain maps are fairly, fairly similar. <clears throat> um, someone asked a question before about bilateral. I agree with Cameron. I, I really want to try to find someone with unilateral signs. If they've got bilateral signs, then I'm really uh, questioning SIJ dysfunction as being, being um, the major uh, contributor. Um, We've talked about the diagnostic challenges. So lumbar, so when you're working them up, you're thinking lumbar spine, uh, hip, and uh, the sacroiliac joint. Remember our imaging studies don't help us that much for SIJ dysfunction because MRI scans and um, the, other, the other useful uh, imaging studies, your nuclear bone scan, they're very specific or relatively specific, but not overly sensitive. So we're going to 
expect a lot of false negatives. And even though I do use the, the nuclear bone scan a lot, I always tell the patients, look, let's go and get this nuclear scan. Um, uh, if it's positive and everything lines up, fantastic. You know, we feel really confident moving forward. If it's negative, don't worry. That doesn't mean that we've, we've, mi we've missed the boat or that it, it doesn't mean that you don't have sacroiliac joint dysfunction. And that's just because of the nature of what the test can, can do for us. So um, this is the algorithm really, your history, uh, physical examination, um, the, the, the description and location of pain, which they call uh, the, the Fortin's finger sign, finger test, and then the provocation test, the sacroiliac joint provocation test, and then moving forward to uh, the intra-articular uh, diagnostic blocks. And of course, with our uh, imaging as part of this initial workup. I didn't hear, Karen, did you get, uh, were you getting nuclear bone scans fairly commonly or? Um, yes, I do. Yeah, mm. And we sort of spoke a bit about uh, sort of the false negatives and mm. proceeding with those that, you know, we sort of touched on and tried to move around those that are false negative and then going from there to injections without much imaging, mm. maybe injections, we're still operating on those. Um, I haven't got a great number like that. You might be able to add to that part of the discussion. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, uh, the examination, of course, I, I wouldn't hesitate to, if I was a bit concerned about hip pathology, I'm not an orthopedic uh, hip surgeon, um, so I would, wouldn't hesitate to work closely with a hip, hip specialist and say, look, you know, what do you think about the hip structure here? Um, uh, do they have dual pathology? Have they got some SIJ dysfunction and hip pathology? Rule that out. I've had one patient who was a bit upset that, that we did her SIJ and then six months later she was still getting a bit of pain around the hip. She thought that was going to disappear and then she, she sort of um, uh, referred herself or got a, got a referral to a hip specialist and then he had to do something to her hip as well. And she had dual pathology but um, you know I think I probably should have uh, informed her that the hip was a contributor to her, and I could have easily done that by just sending her to a hip specialist before the SIJ surgery. I could just actually add one thing there. Having got some experience with hips, but that's a good point that I didn't actually think of and I should have mentioned it before, was those were where I do think there's a bit of dual pathology with the hip and with the MRI that we were adding before, like is worth getting those MRIs on the hip. If I see anything intra-articular, and they've got a little bit of anterior pain, a little bit of impingement, I will actually send them off for an injection into their hip. Um, I don't think it's, you know, I mean, anything more invasive than an SI injection, patients are pretty happy, and it just pretty much either shuts that door, um, and, and I've had a few people like that, and surprisingly, actually, I have then sent them on uh, to my colleagues at Scope Hips because that has turned out to be their thing, even though they did have positive SIJ findings, so. Yeah. I think that's a good point. I definitely do send them off for um, hip injections if I suspect you will. Mm -hmm. And that if you if you alleviate uh, some hip pain that is contributing to their movement dysfunction, that can that can be enough to push them back into a, a better functional state, such that the the movement dysfunction then alleviates the SIJ, and all of a sudden you've you've fixed the whole apple cart by by um, uh, eliminating pain, which of course feeds into um, poor movement. So Fortin's finger test, they want to, they want to be pointing out over the SIJ, over the, the, uh, the ligaments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, tenderness, of course, the ligaments and, and all those soft tissue structures around the joint um, uh, are likely to be tender. And then um, the SIJ provocation tests. It took me a little while to get comfortable doing these, um, but you really want to practice this. Uh, if you haven't, if you're not used to doing this, then you know practice on your, your kids or your or your you know like you, like we used to do before vivas and stuff. You know just just practice doing it quickly and swiftly. Otherwise, it's a bit cumbersome. You roll them over and you roll them this way and that way. And oh, hang on, I've got to get you back to this position. And why didn't I just do that before I rolled you left and right? Um, and and these are the uh, these are the five um, tests. I sort of throw in there a Trendelenburg as well. Um, 
And uh, so realizing that if you are doing compression and it's uh, a, uh, what's that? That's her left side facing the roof, left side here. So if, if you've got a positive compression test, though, it's on under your hand on the left hand side. If you roll them over facing you, uh, then the pain will be on the other side. Sometimes they, you do that and they feel the pain on the other side. And you know, I think that's, that's, not, that's not a positive result then. Um, what else was there? When you're doing these tests like the thrust, the thigh thrust, you need to be quite high. Um, so I've got a, a little stool under the, um, the couch that I, I stand up on two steps and then get my shoulder in onto the on top of their on top of their knee i don't find that really that that photograph there doesn't allow me to do too much in terms of leveraging the uh the ileum down so have a have a nice examination or, or if, you, if you're fancy and you can lower your table then that's cool too uh okay so when to proceed with sij provocation um uh, this is what I give to the patients. This is not a Medtronic chart, but it, it covers everything on there. And it's a record that, um, that you've got of the, the diagnostic workup, which is important. Um, we had a bit of a chat about this with our radiologist. So, uh, you can sort of look at that, but it really it boils down to having a good radiologist and a service that you use consistently. Um, uh, I, I was a bit skeptical when the radiologist didn't give me pictures of the, where the, the the needle was, uh, particularly if it was a if it was a um, a negative negative result uh, with a lot of positive clinical findings. Um, and this is the the fibrous portion of the joint, and as you go more cordially, the the intra-articular portion of the joint increases. So your radiologist needs to put, for a, for a unilateral procedure, he's going to put two needles in at least into the fibrous portion and into the intra-articular portion down low. Um, uh, sometimes they'll use contrast. They don't, tend to, they don't tend to use contrast anymore. And if anyone's sort of doing it without CT now, I think that's probably... You're probably not getting the best best option. Do you think it's worth blocking the ligamentous part separately from the? In two like, on two different days or at the same? Yeah, with two with two entry points. Yeah, they'll 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 put the needle in two two times. Up here, this is the 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 fibrous part of the joint. Yeah, yeah, they they do block that. They do both. They, yeah, no, they want to block the, the, the superior and inferior portion. Yep. And that's, that's what my guy does anyway. Um, and he, he wants to get local anaesthetic into that, that superior portion. Um, there, is a little bit of, there is a little bit of articular um, component uh, cranially, uh, but it's, it's a lot larger down, down here and less fibrous. What were you thinking? You're thinking that it's not necessary or...? The, uh, the injections I've done have all been just particular. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd have to say I, I mean, I have a good relationship with my radiologist, mm. but I, I pretty much took in the three D model and said that's where I want the needle. To so go. just one one spot. And I'm pretty much Down here. aiming more into that particular component, but I always do yeah. look at the imaging to make sure because we get quite a few fly out through Queensland X ray that we're leaving. And, um, yeah. Making sure that it is going there, but yeah. it is interesting that I mean, that you do both. I mean, I guess I've never really pushed the ligamentous part because I've always worried about a little bit of uh, sort of overlap if I'm a bit higher up, mm -hmm. you know, more cranially, and then oh, that will, you know, I'm more create more a bit of a false. Yeah, like if they've got pathology in the facet. Yeah, for high, sure. I've sort of thought, oh, I might yeah. sort of building the two, but yeah. equally so if you do a five-one facet. Yeah, and, and that, that's why we want to keep the volume. More, what did I put here? Yeah, uh, too, half yeah. a mil or one yeah. mil, you know, like really small volumes. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and also, you know, local anaesthetic. No, I can we can give a steroid injection into the into the arm, and feel, people feel oh my back pain's better you know, because of this corticosteroid effect. Uh, those provocation testing, these three seems to be the most um, useful if you get a positive distraction, the thrust and the compression. You know, they're saying that we're going to bump up our 
sensitivity and specificity with those being positive. And, th and these are all re referenced off SIJ injections. So we come down to our, um, our management options, medications, external support, physical therapy, um, uh, the interventional blocks, short or long acting, and then the uh, radiofrequency ablations. I, I really haven't had much success with any of those. Even once, once you've really got that, that pain cycle uh, up and running and a lot of ongoing dysfunction, it's very hard to rehabilitate that um, because the pain itself is the, the pain itself is the movement obstructing barrier. And if you've got a movement obstructing barrier, you can't eliminate the, the dysfunctional movement that's required. And so you've got to do something to break that cycle and that's when, that's when the surgery comes in. Okay, so um, just a, a little bit about the navigated uh, procedure. Um, it just increases the, the whole ease of the operation exponentially. Um, I say to Sylvia all the time, this is, this is our favorite operation. Um, and the, the guided pack needle technique, which I think I'm probably the only one who does that, not too many people use the pack needle now, do they? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm so familiar with using the pack needle um, that, that I've just transferred that over from doing perk pedicle screws to the, um, the, the perk SIJ. And um, we, can, we can do the whole operation like we're doing a brain biopsy. We've mapped the whole thing out before we've even um, incised the skin uh, as, we, as you would to do a brain biopsy. There's the target. Um, we bring in, our, bring in our biopsy arm, map it all out, and then, um, and then drop the needle down onto the scalp, uh, which is where you're going to make your incision. So do it, if we do it the same way, the accuracy is incredible. Uh, and what's the evidence out there? You know, there's, there's, I know, there's quite a few papers already talking about the, um, the utility of sacroiliac joint uh, fusion and stabilization and uh, Sylvia was kind enough to forward this to me which which is a Medtronic publication that um, showed uh, comparable um, stability to the three implant side bone system with the tri triangular implants uh, Pre-op imaging, I used to be pretty paranoid about getting all of this stuff when I was doing the side bone technique with the, the purely lateral approach. N now I'm, I'm really not too fussed, it's just a standard CT scan, but if, you, if you're still using the lateral approach with the side bone, then you're probably best uh, to keep looking at those bones in those planes. And then um, and getting familiar with the, uh, the pelvis views and as uh, our neurosurgical training, we weren't really looking at the pelvis very often at all, so it took us a little while to get familiar with inlet and outlet views, and, and I, I still get them mixed up. I, I really just call this an axial view, and this is an, a, an anterior view, and a lateral. I, I keep getting inlet, outlet wrong. And that's how we generate our inlet and um, outlet images with the gantry angle of the uh, fluoro machine. Um, again, this is relevant when we're, we're doing fluoro-guided fluoro uh, surgery and when we're, we're coming in laterally, but with, um, with the 3D navigation, all of that is, is um, not as critical. That's what a machine looks like. This is the body tom at uh, one of the hospitals in Brisbane. We've now moved on to O-Arm which is even better because it integrates seamlessly with all of the equipment that uh, Medtronic provides for, um, uh, for the surgery. And what is it we've got here in terms of the hip pad? Just a horizontal hip pad. Uh, you know how you can have those hip pads with the angle, the angulated um, hip supports? Try to get your hands on one that just goes purely horizontally across the hips. And I think that that may just stop a little bit of that anterior translation of the sacrum if you've got a real un really unstable SIJ. Uh, I, I would bring a pelvic model into the surgery, the first couple of cases that, that you do, just to sort of allow your brain to visualize the anatomy a little bit easier, just pop it next to the operating area. And you go, oh, okay, that's what, I'm, that's what I, the bone I'm about to feel there, and that's what I'm, 
that's what I, uh, it just helps my brain sort of work out the angles. So imagine that we haven't incised the skin yet. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just mark out our, our pelvic crest, our iliac crest and um, roughly where we would uh, be putting our, um, uh, uh, expecting our incisions to go and also marking out where we're going to uh, put our pin site. If we were doing bilateral procedures, if we were doing bilateral SIJ, uh, you'd have this area exposed here because you'll, you'll put your spinous, you'll put your navigation frame on the spine of L5. Um, but this is much less invasive, just to percutaneously pop that into the crest. Um, I haven't had much success just percutaneously popping it onto their site, the spinous process. You really need to dissect down, clear the spine on both sides. It's still a small incision, but I can't hammer it into the spinous process successfully. Um, so we, we mark out our space, uh, drape it up, and then bring the arm in to do our spin. And the spin can collect uh, both left and right SIJ in one spin. You don't need to do that in, in two stages. And then, um, so we still haven't made a we still haven't made an incision on the skin at this point. I'm now uh, I'm now holding the the navigation wand and just moving it around our exposed um, uh, <coughs> prepped area and just picking out two two trajectories. I want to pick out two trajectories. And, and create a create a plan of where they're going to be, and um, and then once I'm happy that I've got two two trajectories, I'll then make the um, the skin incision based on those two virtual trajectories tra trajectories. And so your skin incision is perfectly placed for the whole system to the the, the perfectly placed for the corridor that you're going to create. And then you just get your assistant to retract with a couple of small uh, Langenbachs and retracting in the, in, the, in the plane that you're going to be doing your muscle splitting dissection down to the, that external out, outward surface of the ileum. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite shallow under there. It's not, there's not a long, um, there's not a, you know, unless they're extremely obese, but this is sort of the, the narrowest part of their back. This is the closest that their bones come to the back almost. So you're avoiding all that gluteal uh, adipose tissue and muscle. Um, so yeah, dissecting down to the, the ileum. And then uh, the, next, the next stage is to drop your pack needle into the, the bone. And we've already set we've already set our our, tra our, tra our virtual path there in in the green, and I'm just just following that path down and just tapping tapping the pack needle in. That's pretty straightforward. That was that was sort of the the virtual trajectory. I thought oh, I'll make a bit of a modification to this, so you can see I haven't quite followed it. Once I actually got down to the surface of the bone, I thought this is this is going to get me a, a little bit of extra distance between. Uh, two surfaces, so I just may on the fly just change it a little bit, um, which is fine. And then that now becomes our new trajectory. Okay, so we just abandon that one because this is a little bit more favourable. But it, it's just a guide. Oop, and there's our pack needle, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So here's our navigation balls, and um, and this is the pack needle. And then of course you just you uh, drop a K wire down that pack needle, exchange it, drop the K wire down it. And then we've got a navigated tap, um, which then just you know you don't even have to think really. Just drop that, drop that, um, <coughs> drop that tap over your kwa. It's just going to follow the path that you've created down. Uh, just transgress the the, uh, the the cortical surface of the sacrum, and then uh, take it back out. And now you're left with a a uh, a little a little divot. <laughs> For you to then bring in the the specific um, Rialto wideboard tap, and it's easy to just plop that onto the hole that you've created because you you used a what, what is that tap diameter? Right? So yeah, it's that 11. that one or the 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 cannulated tap. The cannulated will use the 7.5. 7.5. So you got a 7.5 millimeter hole that that just plops onto, that just plops onto, 
and now we've got our, 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 our trajectory still there or we, we can create a new trajectory based on that cannulated tap from the previous step and you just uh, power ease that through um, to the depth that you you want to you want for your implant and um, leave that in place don't, don't take once you've got it down the, down into your sacrum just leave that in place because you don't want to take that out you get a lot of bleeding because that's when you get a gauge up the size of your implant and um, and prepare your implant with the graft so once I once I've got the the implant sized and packed with uh, with a bit of infuse, I just make it like an infuse sandwich with some flex, the, the strips of um, D, D, DBM graft on, graft on flex, and just a, uh, uh, just a little sandwich of that, and then slide that down the um, slide that down the the opening of the Rialto, and then I just cut a few small patty sized, or maybe micro patty, not 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 as big as a small patty. And you know how there's all those little holes? You just ram them into the hole circumferentially and up and down the, up and down the implant. Um, and they're sort of sticking out a little bit so that you're gonna get a bit of contact. Um, and then once you've got that all ready to go, you just reverse drive the, uh, the wide bore tap out. You'll get a bit of a gush of bleeding because um, it's, quite, it's, quite it's quite a menacing looking um, tap really. Uh, and then within two seconds, you pop your, your Rialto uh, implant over the bleeding site and then you're ready to uh, follow your your next um, trajectory straight in and you could almost do it blindfolded um, and just stop at the right time and that's the power ease that makes it I mean you don't have to use that you can do it all by hand but that just it really does make it um, very very uh, easy and then your final product oh, and, then, and then you move move on to your, your second implant through that 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 other incision that you would already mapped out and if you map them out nicely at the beginning spend five minutes mapping them out nicely at the beginning you'll get the optimum placement of two screws very very easily very little blood loss and looks quite good and they feel fantastic I put um, I give them a bit of uh, uh, Iceman. I put an Iceman pack on there. Just get them to, when we roll them off the table, I get the wardies to just set up the Iceman at the position of where the surgery is going to, where they're going to land. And so they're in recovery. They're up on the ward while they're still waking up from their anesthetic with a nice cooling Iceman just to keep inflammation down. And um, they really feel like, have you done an operation on me? They, uh, it's, it's bizarre. <laughs> and. Um, but they get up the next day feeling pretty good, uh, ready to go home. And that's a couple of the earlier ones with the side bone. And I used to, that was hard work, really hard work to, in comparison to the, um, to the Rialto. So I think that covers, that covers most of the technique that we, we uh, use for it. Okay. No issues with any sort of inflammatory aggravation with being being infused. I haven't. I haven't. No. Yeah. We we X-ray them and follow them up. Like they hang around with us for a, a few months afterwards at our at our rehab centre. And um, yeah, and then just the, just the just the well the bit that's nicely enclosed is just a strip that uh, how long how what would the dimensions be? It'd be probably imagine half a paddle pop stick and then you just sandwich that between two similar shaped um, grafts graftons the the you know the stiffer grafton that's called flex and then i used to sort of suture it together so it didn't flap open and then shove it in there and then the the ones that we put in the holes are very small like maybe a tad bigger than a micro patty yeah. but so just poke poke them in the holes yeah yeah because that, that graft that we've got in the, in, in the middle of the chamber, it's sort of, you think, is that, that's not really making any contact with the bone, it's sort of hidden. So I just, wanna, I just want something to, and I don't pack every single hole. Um, just, you know, up and down. And, but no, I haven't, I, I, you know, I haven't had any of that osteonecrosis. Well, I'm sure it's possible.
I don't know what to do if it does. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks guys.